Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to our monthly ICG lab talk series. This is the second time we meet this semester. So last semester we had uh, Bernhard Keynes from Imperial College in London. And this time we have uh, Professor Jörn Kohlhammer. So Jörn uh, is the head of the Competence Center for InfoBees and Visual Analytics uh, at Fraunhofer IGD. And he's also a professor for user-centered visual analytics at TU Darmstadt. And uh, Jörn did his master's at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, and then he moved to TU Darmstadt to do his PhD here, uh, there, and then uh, he's, he moved to Fraunhofer, where he's still um, uh, leading the research group. His personal research interests include decision-centered information visualization and also visual business analytics. And I'm sure Jörn will show us uh, very interesting projects, and we're looking forward to this talk. Thank you. It's a Big pleasure to have you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, uh, hello, welcome to this talk. And um, thank you also for the invitation to Linz. Um, yeah, as Mark already said, I'm from Fraunhofer IGD. I don't know how many of you know Fraunhofer. Okay, you know it. <laughs> yeah, so five, so, so not everyone. So, Fraunhofer, just if two words then about it. So Fraunhofer is really a, an applied, in, applied research institute. So we try to build the bridge between university and companies, industry. So whatever comes out of university is usually not fit for directly applying that to industry technology. There are some steps that you need to take to make it marketable, to make it industry capable. And that's what Fraunhofer really tries to do. So my talk will, will probably start on the research side and then go towards the real application side. And as the talk already says, we, we, try to, we, we really want to apply visual analytics to real world problems. So people that come to us, real world data, not cleaned, no quality, and they want to get something out of it for their, for their use case, for their business case. So, that's what Fraunhofer is. Fraunhofer IGD is one institute. So just one slide about uh, us. One institute with four um, entities, one in Rostock, one really nearby here in Graz. And since one month now, a full institute in Singapore, which is not only IGD anymore, but also part of SIT and, and some other institutes. So Fraunhofer is not only in Germany, as you can see, but in Europe and, and also beyond that. But the, the major, the, ma the, the main institute is really in Darmstadt, that's where I come from. And we have a few departments that work on different things. Um, mine is here, information visualization and visual analytics. But um, cultural heritage digitization is, is a computer vision, visual computing um, department, which uh, is very much, much closer to, to, what, to the nice demos I saw earlier today. Um, or medical imaging and cognitive computing. So everything that has to do with visual computing. So enough about Fraunhofer and Fraunhofer ITD. Um, going towards visual analytics. So what we are doing, so I'm, I'm heading a department um, with two new employees. That's why I don't have nice pictures of them. Some of you may, might know Thorsten and, and Jürgen and Tatjana who are on the university side. Fraunhofer always has a, a model of applied research, but also very close by a university that does the basic research. And then we intertwine the both sides of research for the benefit of a customer, hopefully. So that's what we do here. And we have some lectures, of course, on information visualization, and visual analytics. And uh, I give one since two years now on user-centered design for visual computing. And these two topics will also play a role in my, in my talk today. Um, on applying visual analytics. So what do we do when we talk about applying visual analytics? Maybe first as an overview, what, what domains are out there who are really interested in, in applying visual analytics? Um, business analytics is like a topic that took off five years ago. Everyone talks about business analytics, advanced analytics in, in the business uh, area now. They want to use more and more data from the social media and, and everywhere, all kinds of databases to apply analytics to that. 
and visualization plays a large role in here. The public sector has been maybe one of the first adopters of visualization, if you really think about it, uh, especially in the US, where government programs to, to make use of data in the UK, open data, the open data movement is quite strong, and visualization played a big role there, even though those are not like the shiny domains where you say, okay, this is, um, this is something that we really want to do. But it's, th those are interesting programs. I will not talk too much about that. Cybersecurity, it has been maybe the first topic ever to, to call visual analytics, visual analytics. That's when it started in, in the US about security, about cybersecurity and medical data probably since three, four years it really became a topic, at least in Germany, where people are applying visual analytics to that. But I will talk about some of the application areas more closely later on. Our research focus, well, we try to, since we've been working on this topic since 2004, 2005, we really wanted to, to get a grasp on how, what, what should a, an infrastructure look like that really supports visual analytics for all kinds of data sources and all kinds of visualizations. I think we are now in the fifth one that we, that we established um, to, to make this happen. But they are getting more and more capable and more, more yeah, powerful. Time-oriented data, design studies, and evaluation, all this comes into focus around visual analytics, and I will, I will talk more about this now. But let's maybe take a look back at visual analytics at how this started. I already said it all started with security and cybersecurity. I don't know if you know this book. I, I took a, a real copy of my own book so that, that it has all these wrinkles and um, bent pages. But this is where Jim Thomas started with this topic around 2002, 2001, 2002, on um, building a visual analytics research and development agenda, which was more or less a research agenda around um, visualization and some people who did information visualization with a vision of, can we bring visualization into an area where we can, yeah, can, can use more and more data with our visualization since that was the big problem. We had too much data and we couldn't really visualize all that. And there's automated analysis. How can we bring this all together? This was the topic of the, of the first research agenda. In 2010, we ended a, a, an EU um, project called Vismaster, which was coordinated by me and Daniel Keim from the University of Constance. He was the research coordinator of this, of this huge project, really, with 37 partners, I think, in, in, in the EU which was already called solving problems, because here it wasn't really about solving problems. Here we, we talked more about solving problems with visual analytics. So what, what is out there that we can apply visual analytics to? And um, to show the, the path that we took, maybe in different, different partners of this, of this Wismaster consortium, I published a book uh, three years ago on visual business analytics where we try to help people out there on the streets, so to say, to really use visualization and visual analytics for their own data. Since uh, the big problem in the business analytics and business intelligence community is that people have tools now, like Tableau, or for ages they have Excel, but that doesn't mean that you know how to use these. I mean, you can do all kinds of things to your data with these tools. But the problem is, what do you really want to do? What do you really want to achieve with the data? Um, and that should be the first question you ask yourself when you're using these tools. And that is really what this, this book is about. This was the fastest selling book in this TDWI data warehousing and databases series. So it's sold out now, achievement of two and a half years. Um, and we are currently working on the second edition. So there's a lot of need in the market for applying visual analytics to, to real problems and, and learning more about what, what do we need to know to, to apply these techniques. So that's pretty much that's what I just wanted to show, not, not because I wrote this book, but um, it's just an example um, from a, a general R&D agenda to where we are now 10 years later, where we really have this on business analytics. I'm sure 
soon Mark will write a book on applying visual analytics to, to pharmacal, pharmaceutical data or something like that, or someone else. So we, we will see more and more of these applying visual analytics to some domain. Since there's so much, there's so much specific, specific, well, specialty <laughs> about certain domains um, that, that we need to talk about here, not only about, well, don't use red and green as your first colors. So let's go back to, to CART. I'm sure you all know this. I don't have to talk much about it. It's the information visualization pipeline. You know it probably in a different style. That's how it we use in our book. So what, this is pretty much what we, what we all learn, what everyone who, who well, deals with information visualization learns about um, the path from raw data to views that a user with a task can interact with. And it's, it's pretty, pretty fun. I mean, you start with raw data, you have lots of data, you bring that into some kind of data table, then you choose the best possible visual structures that can show this data in an effective and correct way. And then you have some kind of view with interactive stuff around it to play around with the data. So if you ask yourself, okay, is that, is that making the, the user happy in this, in this path? And what we often experience is well the user is not is not really happy at that moment even if he or she can interact with the data and i'm not talking about gapminder now i just took the example here but the problem is coming from raw data towards some view asking yourself okay what kind of data do i have i have network data and i have some cool uh, metadata around it so maybe I can show this in this structure. I should have a nice network visualization, maybe some interaction here and there. And then you end up with some tool that, and you never ask yourself, what does the user actually want to do with the data? So in the, I'm, of course I'm exaggerating, but this is what can happen. Or this is what, what we see often happens. Or you could also uh, tell it like, like visualize. I, I really like this, uh, this uh, this uh, graphic from Visualize. I don't know if you know the company. It's in Innsbruck. They, it's, a, it's a company called Visualize. You just see the link. It's a really interesting company with an interesting CEO, Christoph Holz. And they, they sell visualizations. So the only thing they do, it's a small startup in Innsbruck um, selling stream graphs. That's their main product and some other uh, visualizations. And they really say, okay, can we do something better than the typical dashboard that you see? And if you, if you look at what people do with Excel or other tools, that's really what they do. They have some kind of data and maybe I can, why don't I show it as a, as a pie chart or some other chart that I like, it's colorful, maybe 3D. People start doing things like that. So they have data and they do pie charts or funny little cows in their pie charts or they even Deutsche Bahn um, thinks 3D is still cool for, for showing five. Now you see where the line ends or starts. So this is a chart, of course. Deutsche Bahn is, of course, a great company, but um, um, <laughs> it is a terrible chart. Or also pie charts with more than 10 or 12 numbers are just unreadable, especially if you use different blue shades, shades of blue, to denote uh, different factors. So that's what's out there. That's what people do. Maybe some people even do black and white. And so that's where we started with the book. And that's where we, that's where we have to start from to get visual analytics into applications. And so you're not talking to professors of information visualization when you're out there talking to people trying to apply visual analytics. It's So, who is this user? And that's something we, we really ask ourselves when we, when we start doing projects, visual analytics projects with, with potential customers. We want to look at the user first. And of course, that's nothing new. You could say in InfoVis, we have these nice design studies that you see at, at IEEE Viz. If you look at that, 
where at the program you have probably 30%, 35% design studies. But there's two different kinds of design studies that you can do. So the first one is genius design. And you see that quite often. That's the design of where you have a bunch of data and then you sit down with your group and develop some algorithm, algorithm techniques, papers uh, with, a, with a certain design study because you think, okay, yeah, the data, the users don't really understand the data, so I will do a great visualization technique and I will write an even better paper on this and then we will publish it and everything will be fine. That's fine for a research community, for pure research, but it's not so fine if you're trying to sell something to people. Of course, maybe there are some geniuses out there who really can do that, the genius design. So Apple, for example, they don't tell anyone. They say, okay, we know what's best for you and here's the product that you have to buy and everyone's buying the product. Usually that doesn't happen with our visualization, maybe we do something wrong, but um, we learned that the genius design is probably not what we should do for visual analytics techniques or information visualization. But you can, of course, do design studies as a genius design. That's a, that's a standard algorithm technique paper, I would say, is a genius design. So there's no, people talk about, do we really need evaluations in, in InfoBiz papers? Shouldn't we just get out these techniques and show our great ideas? And I think that's, yes, we should. To want to involve the user, we need something like user-centered design. And that's something that we are currently in my group combining with analytics to see what can we learn from these both, from both fields to get to a better solution in the end for, for the users. So what is user-centered design? Usually this is like a no-go in any uh, presentation to have ISO standards, but this is nice and, and simple, I hope. Um, so this is user-centered design. Uh, who, who knows this already? Okay, one, two. Um, so before you do anything, you, you first take a look <coughs> at what you actually want to do by planning the process. But this is, this is really the core of, of what I don't see that much when we, when we look at the typical visual analytics approach out there, is the context of views. So who is actually going to use this? What is the task that this person is really trying to achieve? With what kind of equipment will this person at the end use this visual analytics technique to analyze this data? In which environment? These are really simple questions and you can, if you, even if you ask yourself these four questions quite non-formally, I would assume that the result will be better than never asking these questions. Requirements will come out of the context of use. And then what user-centered design really is, is you do a prototyping very, very early, maybe as a paper prototype or something that is just barely working on a, on a, on a top level where people can see, okay, what, what will it do? What, what does it look like? What colors will it use? To accelerate in the end the, the whole process of building something for real users. And evaluation is something that, well, well you, can, you can do different evaluations. It doesn't have to be the full-blown, um, I need 50 participants and then some cross-validation and um, four different some things. And it just has to see, you just have to see and, and look what, what people are doing with the technique to inform your context of use requirements and prototyping. So for one of our medical data projects, we actually built five different prototypes for them. I will show you the end result then later, but this is this was different prototypes that were closer and closer to, you could say, the mental model of the person that was trying to analyze the data. So in a sense, when we when we look at this model, what we're really doing is, is reversing the entire InfoBiz model. But we have to do this at first. So we start here with the user and the task. We really want to know what he or she is trying to do with some data. The data doesn't, 
it's so it's so disturbing sometimes for for us infobiz people when we talk to these people and they first don't want to talk about the data so how can we do anything without the data but they think well can we first talk about what i want to do <laughs> so okay yeah sure then you ask yourself okay in what form with in what equipment or environment do we need to give you that something that we will build and that really determines what kind of data storage we need to make this happen. And also for this task, what kind of data do we need? Of course, there will be data available and data not available, but this will then be the other direction that we know from Infobase. So that's starting here with the user, moving towards the data and then back to visual structures and views. That's something that we do in, in our applied visual analytics projects. So moving to visual analytics, since that was just InfoVis, and we didn't have to tell the user anything about analytics algorithms, automatic, automatic uh, processing, statistics, everything that users try to avoid to get in touch with. Of course, that's, this, this, that's the older version of Kine's visual analytics model, where you have this going from data over cross visualization to knowledge. And the other path where you take, have data and you apply a certain automatic model to get some knowledge out of it. Not only data mining, you could also have machine learning methods, KDD. And visual analytics from the beginning was always how can we tightly integrate these two paths? So the human can do something really well. That's for example, work with uncertainty or use the knowledge, wealth knowledge to do to, 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 to for a solution. For a model, I really have to describe really, really de in detail what I want the model to do with the data. Because we have some machine learning methods, but still, I have to be very clear of what the model can do, what it can't do, what are the limitations. If you have some uncertainty and, and some expert knowledge that you have to bring into the process, you need to human. But this is the, the, the um, broad view on visual analytics. If you hear, I can tell you a bit about a, a talk that we gave, also Torsten Mai gave from my group, about the, the next level of detail under this, under this circle here. When you go down and really look, what does it mean integrate visualization and automatic algorithms or models? And that's really what you get when you, when you look at it. So we have the data, of course, that, that's just the left part of the, of the lower branch. You have data as input for a model. A model does something with the data, and there's some output. It's simplified, but that's pretty much what you have. Then, of course, you have parameters that can steer the model to do something with the data to produce the output. And you have evaluations in the standard KDD model, um, you have evaluation of the model, evaluation in a KDD sense, not in a human-computer interaction sense. And all these five aspects can be visualized. This up here is the typical InfoVis. So you have data, you visualize it interactively. This down here is the standard data mining pipeline. So you do something with the data, you have a model, you have some output, you visualize that output, you don't like the output, you go back to the start, you change your parameters, and so on. So this is what people know, the, the top and the bottom one. Um, but here, visualization of the parameters, or visualization of the model itself, or visualization of the evaluation. So, so Thorsten showed a few of these um, in the, the C4PGV workshop at IEEE this. So this is what people are mostly aware of. But you have white box integration or visual parameter space analysis that was introduced by Michael Sedemeyer, for example, or model data linking, where you, where you can actually show a model and show the data and try to bring that into, um, into the same screen. Or as an example to better in, 
to better show this, if you look at a white box integration or you could say a glass box integration, that means you can really look inside the model, what is the model doing? Jörg van Wijk and his group did a great job with the Baobab view, which really shows a decision tree. And you can really change things in the decision tree and understand what does the decision tree look like. The entire visual analytics technique is not a decision tree, but the decision tree is the model inside the visual analytics technique. And you can look at the model to understand what the model is really doing. And as I said, there are all kinds of things, sometimes even not named yet, of how to integrate analytics and visualization. Of course, this is not something that this, I mean, this is something that in this, in this sense, I, this is not something you can tell to someone in the, uh, in the domain, like a medical doctor or some guy at the pharmaceutical industry to say, okay, we'll, we'll probably do a white box integration with you. Um, but it is probably interesting to make yourself aware of what am I actually doing with this visual analytics technique? What do I, do I need to show this, this person, this user, some kind of visualization of the parameters or the model, or is it okay if the user just sees the output of the model? Or oh, which of my users, usually you don't only have this one user, but which of my user has to interact and see which part of my integrated visual analytics team. And with the examples I want to show later, I will um, go into more detail on that. So that's what that's why we um, if we show the visual analytics model a bit different with different colors, and that's how we um, really think about applying visual analytics techniques. And that's how we, if you now see the the colored knowledge data visualization analysis here in this pipeline for the approach of our visual analytics project, we will we always start with the end of the pipeline, trying to understand as best as possible what does the customer already know, or the user already know, what what does he or she need to know, relevant information, decisions, goals, then look at the data, and then come up with both visualization and analytics techniques to make this happen for the tool analysis and specification. And then from for us other stuff in addition, like consultancy or tool development or support even, that is uh, <coughs> not so exciting, but um, which is, is sometimes pays the electricity bit. Let's go to two examples. Um, and I, I want to start with medical data since this is some a project that is continuing in, in the area of cancer research, where we apply visual analytics to, to cancer research. And, um, but I want to first say a few words about time-dependent data, which plays a huge role in this, in this cancer research project. So what we, um, what we did for quite a while was think about time series and how we can find similar time series. And this, it runs a video of a SOM now that shows um, daily patterns of research data. So people are measuring, I don't know, the, the oxygen um, degree in different parts of the world oceans. And there are, certain, there are certain daily patterns of this, or maybe the sun intensity. And what you can do is you can really um, paint certain time, time uh, time progressions of these different variables. And then in the, in the database of all these, these uh, time-dependent data, the user can then search for uh, wherever is there a, a progression with this shape. What is important um, regarding visual analytics and applying that to, to real-world problems is that if we want to build a visualization or a visual analytics tool that's really helpful for the users, we have to understand what they believe is similar. So what is a similar pattern? And that's really what we talked about for hours and hours with these users. So is this, how similar is this to this? 
is this something that you consider similar as a temperature progression? And they would say, no, no, that's that's totally different than this one. We would say, oh, yeah, really? <laughs> so, um, so finding out that is, is why is it so difficult? I mean, similarity in time measures is, is really a tricky thing since you can really ask yourself, okay, is, it, is our two time series similar if they are completely equal, if they have a time offset for certain things, that's not the case. If there's a value offset, if there's different speed in the progression of a time series, and you can go on and on. It's a subsequence. If two time series share a subsequence, is that similar? Or if it occurs more often, time warping or the level of detail, and in all the projects that we did on where time-dependent data played a role, we spent most of the time talking about similarity measures, which is not something that um, that is really something you see in the end when, when they use the technology, but something that is done on the model level. So that's what we did with the with the doctors, coming back to the actual medical data use case. We have doctors who um, in, in Hamburg at the UKE is the University Clinic for of, of Eppendorf in Hamburg. All they do is they um, do surgery on prostate cancer. So they have 20,000 patients who only had this disease. In database of over 20,000 patients who had prostate cancer, who had surgery, and who are now, well, followed up on. So they have to fill out a questionnaire every year how they feel, what their blood values are, what um, if they're continent, potent, etc. And then for one patient, and that's actually a design study that was was done with with the doctors. They said, okay, we think in green, yellow, and red. Can you do that? I said, yeah, I can do that. And um, we we want to have a bar chart. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay, we can also have a bar chart that. It shows the PSA value. PSA value. The PSA value is is um, the the major <coughs> indicator for prostate cancer. So if the PSA value is above 0 0.2, more or less, then um, this is usually a problem. 0 0.0. .0. So if their mental model was a patient who had surgery is healed until the blood value shows otherwise. So then they are green. If there's a relapse, which means the PSA value goes above a certain value again, as you can see here, then the patient becomes yellow in a sense that there's something that's beyond surgery that we have to do with this patient. So it gets maybe hormone therapy or other, other medication. And if someone is hormone refractory, that means even hormone therapy is not helping to keep the PSA value down, and maybe there are metastases, and the patient maybe dies. So this is a, a bad case, you could say. Um, if you have more cases, um, you get into a more interesting discussion with the medical doctors. And the, um, the question, or, or the interesting thing for doctors is really, I, as a doctor, usually see 30 cases per year, but it's really interesting for me to see 20,000 cases at the same time and find exactly those, those patients very similar to the one sitting right ahead of me in my doctor's office. So finding, finding ways to show all these 20,000 patients at once, these are now not all the 20,000, but we now here have, I think, 4,000 patients. Um, it's interesting also for statistical analysis. So let me show you a short demo. We have to see how Hangout likes that. Yeah, Sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Sorry about that. So here we have more patients. And you can also see well, these, these green patients that stayed normal or stayed fine after surgery. This, these are months here, so we have 192 months, which is a pretty long period. And there's even more patients that, well, they had, they had some kind of refractory, um, but the really bad cases are really only up there. And we, if, we, if we zoom into that, 
we can then only show the ones that, that really had metastasis. Or we can zoom in on the on these guys here. So the, the, the worst ones are of course down here where there's only a short red phase and then death. What you can see on the side is all the metadata that we have for each of the patients. So this was something where we really went from there's a certain task on the right side. What kind of data do we have to available and what is really necessary or helpful for the doctors to see? So what they have is they have, of course, all kinds of um, treatment data, but also important things like the, Greece, the Gleason value, which is a, well, if you put a, a cancer cell under a microscope, you can, or bigger portion biopsy under a microscope, you can really see what, how does the cells look like. And a 4 plus 3, for example, is much worse than, let's see, a, a 3 plus 3 or a 2 plus 3. Since the, the higher the numbers, the worse the cancer is and the more progressed the cancer already is. And you can see that if we select all the red side, um, we have a positive correlation, which is blue, with 3 plus 4. So we have some indicator on the cell um, on the microscope side, so to say, that is reflected also when we when we look on the time-oriented view. The same is true with, with age. So here we have um, the younger people, 56 to 60, who already have prostate cancer, usually have a, a more severe form of prostate cancer, while the older people have a form that they probably wouldn't die of, since they will die of something else. And that that's something that you can uh, see in the data. And then, of course, you can also say, uh, if, if that's so, so interesting, why can you show me all the, all the patients with 3 plus 4? And then it will only show those patients or show me the oldest patients. How is the development there? Because you can, we need to give that this again. So, but uh, to, to end this short demo, Okay. Um, what we really was trying to do is find find the sweet spot of where visual analytics would fit in into this whole pattern of what they really want to do. Patient data management system and what they really need is then in the end have statistics testing and, and all this to, to really follow up on a certain hypothesis. But what took them a lot of time was the exploratory analysis to find hypothesis and and the modeling of cohorts. This, this, is, was, um, this was where we could help them the most to get this, um, this whole process sped up. And in the, in the sense, to combine visual analytics and with other statistics, that's really something that Torsten also showed in at this. You can, of course, combine these different visual analytics methods and interconnect these into, into new pipelines of data coming from data to some output of maybe the third visual analytics technique that you apply. We also continued that with trying to understand more with of the model that is inside a, a doctor's head about could look like or could feel like that this is patient well-being. And again, we have this, this PSA progression. Um, we have therapies, certain indicators. And what we asked the doctor to say is, okay, in each of these sections that we, that we created from the PSA progression, tell us how does the patient probably feel in this phase? We'll go ahead and, and tweak some of these sliders to say, okay, in this phase, probably, yeah, it fits quite well, this is after surgery, it's probably bad, bad. And then um, when you get some hormone therapy, it really feels better and better, it's something like that. And then we trained, um, then we trained a machine learning algorithm to take these expert answers and get um, this inside a model. And after only 50 labels that the doctors did, um, we had only 6% deviations from from what the doctors was uh, were, were thinking about 
the patient well-being. There was one one um, project where we really tried to better understand the doctor's mental model, but also have a better understanding of similar patients. Since right now, if you only look at the time progression and only look at the metadata that you have for the different patients, the similarity is really hard to detect. So it's not so easy to, to say, okay, this patient is similar to that, since there's so many attributes that play a role, that the well-being turned out to be a nice, well, combination of certain attributes to come up with a nice cohort of similar feeling patients. So, um, looking at the time, maybe I have time for a short second example in the business analytics realm. So here we, we were, um, we talked to, to people in energy networks, a completely different area. Um, a problem in, in Germany is that, that energy networks have, yeah, well, the, the energy networks are problematic these days since it's so much renewable energy into the network from the household side and the network was really built for large power plants standing somewhere and distributing power. So with our customer, the user task, and we talked about, okay, what would you need to see? What is your task? What would you want to solve? And they said, well, we really want to understand what the critical areas in our networks are, since sometimes there's a severe problem with too much power coming from the power plant, and there's a lot of sunshine and a lot of wind, and then we get we get to a situation where the networks are not capable to well to, to um, resolve this situation anymore, and we have to shut down certain plants of, and we don't want to do that. So how can we see that in the network? And can you show us what time of year this usually happens? So faster reaction to, to these energy extensions and maybe you can also show us this is a problem area we should modernize our, um, our network at this point. So what we really looked at first was we started with the, with the task and then moved towards what do they need to see. They need to see their network, of course, and how the different, the different um, I forgot what the English term for Mittelspannungsverteilungsstation is. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's like the, the, the distributor, the point of distribution inside the network. So this is not households. This is like the, the distributors that, that uh, are responsible for a number of <coughs> households. Okay. So this, we use the, that's what they actually use is like a subway type of, of um, structure for these different um, stations. And then we, when, we, when you zoom in, and I'll show it in another short demo, when you zoom in, you can see more details. We then remembered that Jörg van Wyk, a while ago, did this nice uh, visualization in 1999, um, where you can actually um, take different, I think he, he did that for employees, and when they come to work, and when they go home, we found some interesting patterns, for example, that in September people seem to be leaving early on Friday and um, some other funny things uh, that he couldn't explain or could explain with this. Um, and this was a, a great metaphor also to use for finding out what, what is actually going on in these energy networks. So we took the daily patterns of the entire network Daily patterns means what happens during one day from morning to from zero to 24 at one station. And put that all, all these daily patterns and cluster them. And we came up with, with 16 clusters, or we, we preset it to 16 clusters, but we also improved Jörg von Weich's technique a bit to say, okay, can we, th these colors are not similarity ordered. So, Blue and, and dark blue are not simil more similar than blue and orange. So can we also order this in a, in a sense that we have a 2D color map um, where similar patterns would also have similar colors? 
And the further away a color is, the further away the, 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 the pattern is from the other pattern. And we actually had a paper on this, on 2D color maps, where we, where we found a nice way on how to do this in a, in a perceivable way. It's really, um, so we have now here, we have the patterns that really have a lot of renewable energy coming into the network. Since this is um, the consumption, and the consumption goes under a zero line, that means more power is produced at this station than um, needed. And here we have these typical, I don't know, factory or winter patterns where a lot of power is consumed. And even if there's some produced during the winter time, it's not enough to, to make up for it. So these are the these are the critical patterns, and you can immediately see that the purplish colors are difficult. And then we can show that in in an entire um, view. And now, if I understand you correctly, this should be easy to see. So we have this this thing here. I will close this down here. Here we have the yeah the clustering view of all these daily patterns of all the stations that we have in the smaller network here on the right side, and you can see that okay we have this these purplish colors up here, um, and the more the winterish blue is is. Uh, where you have a lot of consumption. And we have um, here a timeline view where you can also include or exclude certain months from the... And now if I, if I move into in, into certain station and I see this calendar view, and I can immediately see, okay, this, this, these winter colors here and the more um, orange is, well, it's, it's a, a lower consumption, but also above the zero line. But what is really interesting for me is, is to see, okay, what are our problematic cases? And I can, I can select this, or the user can select this, and I can immediately see, okay, there are some stations that, that have these purplish colors. And I see that with the blue, with the blue bro progress bar. And if I, for example, then go into Newham, I can see uh, it's the typical months where you have lots of sunshine in addition to some wind. Um, let's look at another station here again very strong purple and it is easy then for for the for the user to drill down into the stations that need modernization so coming from the task okay we want to see the problematic cases can you can you show us um, we then took the data that they have the daily patterns we also asked them for other data, for example, weather data, weather prediction data, it was, would, would all be interesting to, to enhance the visual analytics technique to do more. But of course, in the end, if you go from task to, to data, and then back, you have to work with the data that you get. Sure. No. Yes. So this was just two examples of, of visual analytics applications where we really had also the chance and the users had the time to work with us to really find a solution that perfectly fits what they are looking for. Um, maybe let me close with a few things on current and future work since this is also a visit to maybe talk about some interesting cross interests um, time series data is really important for us, <coughs> and with the with the uh, time series, you can of course make it worse with multivariate time series. You can you can um, well think about 
the segmentation and the labeling, how do I do that? What algorithms can I use to do this segmentation and labeling? And how can I tweak these parameters um, of the different algorithms to do segmentation? A quick feedback on quality. So what, yeah. this is something that we, we will work on with Rostock and Wien in a DMG project. Um, so this just started and will hopefully be quite interesting. There's a new EU project that we're working on on another, uh, on another illness, not uh, prostate cancer with Sjögren's syndrome. Please ask me in three months what exactly this is. Um, but um, it's, it's starting on the 1st of January and it's, it also has to do with, with patient progression and what can we do also with time-oriented data and the definition of cohorts on this. Then um, cybersecurity, as I said, is, is, is taking off in, in Germany at the moment. I don't know if it, no, if it was Snowden or <laughs> I don't know what, what happened, but our, our government woke up and said, oh, it's going on in this network. We should we should throw money at someone um, <laughs> to, to solve this problem. Um, we catch some of the, the money, and hopefully we we'll, um, we will do something reasonable for this. Right now, it has to do with network visualization and and then BGP protocols, which is the global routing, um, which is well. Uh, really, really uh, prone to uh, error prone and, and really, really um, attackable. So it's really easy to, to change network traffic on global routing. And at least we should start with showing, visualizing that and then finding solutions. Sensor analytics, I just showed some car data there somewhere. And this is something that we work on with some engineering institutes on sensor um, data. Thorsten Meyer, I showed you some of his VA integration patterns that's, that's going on on the, on the basic research side, I would say. Also with Roy Ruddle from the University of Leeds, we are researching on event sequences. So not absolute time, but relative time, how to show event sequences. And if you want to try out another cool technology is, is that, we, that we work on for, for ages now in a, in a small subgroup in my department, is the visual trend analysis where you can, if you, if you have papers at DBLP, and you want to analyze, okay, who writes similar papers than me, or um, who has also um, published in this area a lot. You want to analyze that over time, maybe finding out that Ben Schneiderman's work is really coming out in your work now, then uh, you can actually see that in DBLP. It's, it's fun to try out. So you will have the slides anyway. So and with that, um, I think I'm open for questions. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jan. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Oliver, do you want to start? Can you go back to the last demo? Okay. Let's see. What's the y axis? So this doesn't have x and y, it's, it's, a, it's an MDS result. So it's a clustering result where it just shows that if a, if a point is close to another point, it means it's, it's quite similar. Okay, so the x-axis is month. No, no, this, this is something that we heard a lot. Um, this is just the space, and here we had the slider. So we should have moved the slider somewhere over there, so that it doesn't look like it's a time. So that's... The coordinates of the points, how do you know where the point are? What's the meaning of the x-y coordinates of each point? So it's... Well, this is a, a similarity preserving dimensionality reduction. And like with PCA, uh, MDS really structures these points um, to, to have a better, well, distribution on, a similar, on the similarity axis that reside. So all it really is, is well, it is condensed so that it's not too dispersed, but two, two lines that are really close together are also similar. Here you can see the detail view. And this one is really different mm -hmm. from the maximum distance here. You cannot see that. Yeah, so this one starts at the at end somehow. And this should go, OK, this is very different. This has a peak in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it's very different from that. 
So this is high values. Maybe this is more the ones with a peak uh, when people come back from work. And this is uh, one where people go, for example, drive to work. No one is at home, but the solar energy system really runs wild. And then they come back and start to consume energy. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, okay. um, I, was, I have a question for the first table. Uh, okay. Let's see. Should should also be somewhere here. Um, so the plot in the middle of the patient list um, yeah. shows me when I select uh, the center line, um, how many patients are uh, wide um, on the left or to the right? I don't understand. So the x axis is the time in months, yeah. left and right. So for my time now, or maybe you can no. explain it. To okay. Us. So this is this has. What you, what you can do up here with this interface is to, to set certain synchronization points. So this synchronization point would mean, okay, show me if, if the zero line is between the green and the yellow phase, then you would, let me start, like, start it like this again. So, so this would order all the patients by their green line, but um, so I can easily see what patient, who, who is the patient that had the longest green line? So I can also go inside and you see a level of detail with the PSL value here. So this patient had for, I don't know, three or four years a PSA value of zero. And then this is relative here. I don't know what, what the value here is. So these are the ones with the longest green lines. If I go back, I think this is the one I had. So if I understand correctly, then the line that goes from green to yellow to red is still one patient. So this is yeah. one timeline from one patient. This, this is always one patient. But you stack the different patients and you can synchronize them to a certain point. Mm -hmm. okay. So for example, to where the yellow line starts. Mm -hmm. And then you can see there, there are patients with a lot of, lot of months of yellow okay. without any metastasis and maybe dying of something else since um, the, the black points mean died of disease. But sometimes they also have a, a white point, which means died of something else. And with the older patients, that's a um, very, very um, common case. Yeah. Uh, can the patient, patient go back to green or the yellow? Yeah. And but this is not know. this is not supported in this <laughs> version yet. But it was actually the last discussions we had uh, in October with the with the doctors. They said, well, you can get back to green. So um, a yellow, for example, uh, yellow, when, when someone turns yellow, then uh, often they get radiation therapy. And radiation can really turn out to, to destroy whatever's left of the tumor. And then you're green again. So and what we actually would need is not a, a linear time, but we would need a branching time. So with different, um, so that if you have more patients that you can see who go? Who went up the, the upper branch, the lower branch? Who got radiation therapy and then went green again, and so on? But this this would really complicate things, um, and we are still in discussion of whether the medical doctors really want to see that. We can do it. But it's a question of the task. What they really want now is to have two cohorts, and one at the, at the bottom part of the screen and uh, the top and the bottom, and then compare these two also with the metadata and the specificities. Okay, I have one comment and one question. The comment is I found it funny that you asked the doctors about the well-being being of the patients instead of asking the patients, but probably that was also the project. Like because you could also ask the patients how they yeah, feel instead of asking the, the, the patient would, would feel terrible and, and couldn't and it's really, really hard for the patient, but the, the doctor has, it's really hard to, to I mean, you have, you, you have a, a certain form of cancer and they ask you, well, today I'm feeling pretty, pretty nice. This is so dependent on the, on the, the personality of the, of the patient. But the doctor has a certain experience, an expert doctor who, who saw 100, 200 patients um, has a certain experience of and this medication, he will probably feel quite dizzy, but uh, he wouldn't feel that effect. And um, usually, usually my patients tend to feel better. 
So I think so this is all assumption mental model. This is nothing crisp. Yeah. Okay, and my question is, so you talked about time series data, and when you can this cluster time series data, you let the user sketch the curve, mm -hmm. then you're always acting on one one level of granularity. Mm -hmm. But you could have like macro patterns and micro patterns, like daily patterns, monthly patterns. Mm -hmm. but how do you handle that in your projects? Are you usually like just investigating one scale or one one level, macro level, for instance, or how do you treat that in time series? It's a good question. Um, so here you, you, but I guess in the, if I think about the different projects that we had, the daily patterns in the research data were, were the natural thing that, that these, um, these users uh, thought about. And on the energy network, there was also a natural, um, that was the pattern that we, we're supposed to use. I think your question goes to well, future work. <laughs> and also, I, I don't have a good answer for that, since we didn't encounter that uh, that much in our projects yet. But it would be interesting to see how, how that develops. I mean, I've seen I've seen things in cybersecurity that we published at Vissec, where you have the entire network traffic, and then you you carve out certain certain streams um, from from this daily or the weekly pattern down to seconds or minutes but this is not what you meant for the similarity search okay one quick final question okay yeah. a quick final question um regarding the user-centered design mm -hmm. process um you told, you said briefly that you um that you get a task from the users so you do user tasks and um, then i would like to know um do you do paper prototyping or how do you uh, come from the task to your actual software at the end? So do you have some previous stages before you implement this uh, visualizations? Yeah, yeah, so the paper prototypes is something that we use a lot, also with um, supported by um, apps on tablets where we really let the, the doctors paint what they want to see so that we can record this somehow. And then the next stage is really a clickable prototype where we can show what it would look like um, and then moving towards more and more functionality in the prototype. Um, we used a lot of, we, we use a lot of, even if it's only Frankfurt Hamburg, we use a lot of online demoing and, and feedbacks through this channel to get as much feedback in early stages as possible. Okay. Yeah. So if there are further questions, we can just inform <coughs> them and you can approach uh, Jan after the talk. Uh, thanks yeah. everyone for coming. The next talk will be in December. We will send out a notification by email uh, in time uh, before before the talk happens. And um, please sign if you're part of the seminar. It will be a, a signature list. And other than that, have a nice evening. Let's thank Jan again for this really interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you.